Ryan Stevenson, thanks for being here with us on the Made It in Music podcast. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you are, uh, man, just absolutely killing it, and I'm excited to hear <laughs> your story. Uh, so let's just take it all the way back to the beginning. What was the first dollar that you made in music? You know, I think it was probably a love offering. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, actually, I, I can probably say the first uh, legitimate dollar that came as a check in the mail was when I was a songwriter for a previous alum goatee artist named Paul Wright. Uh, who was on Goatee years ago. Paul was my roommate in college, and uh, we played in a band together all through college in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, when Paul got signed to Goatee in 2002 or three, uh, I was a songwriter on a couple of songs on his first record, and I remember a, uh, a check coming from ASCAP one day for sales royalties for yeah. that. And so I was like, man, $63. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Long time, man. Yeah. So yeah. between that $63 Paul Wright check and being able to actually jump full time into it, what was what was the journey there? An incredible journey, dude. Um, a lot happened in that span of time. Uh, so Paul and I were in a band together in college. Paul got offered a record deal uh, years ago and became Paul Wright, the solo artist. The band kind of disbanded. We went and did our own thing. And all of those years in the interim, I, be I went back to school and became a paramedic and got my paramedic license in the state of Idaho. And so I worked as a paramedic for almost nine years. Um, and during those nine years, I worked as a paramedic 48 hours a week, so I worked two 24-hour shifts, and I had five days off every week to basically do what I wanted. And what I wanted to do was play music. Like, that, that dream and that passion never died just because our band went away. And uh, so I worked 48 hours a week, two days in a row, and then hit the ground running five days a week. So over the next several years, I kept leading worship in church, and I would play uh, just regional and local uh, little events, coffee shops, camps, conferences, churches, anything that would let me, that would invite me to go play regionally, I would just do that as Ryan Stevenson, just kind of slowly over the years cultivated this little regional Northwest, mm. Pacific Northwest thing until uh, about 2010, um, things kind of, through a crazy set of circumstances, flip-flopped and transitioned me out of the paramedic world into Christian music. <laughs> yeah. So what was the, you know, I guess big break there? Like, how did you get first introduced to record labels? Because you're, you're obviously, you know, now signed and yeah. um, killing it on the radio charts and everything. But what, what was the first introduction there? Um. Well, I was working as a paramedic, and I, my passion, my dream was to really be able to do music full-time. Um, you know, and working on the streets in the paramedic world can be really toxic. It can be really taxing, very stressful, emotionally just uh, pretty rough on, on a person. And I did that for years, and I was kind of coming to this point where I just knew, man, I'm either going to have to transition and do something else or... I'm just going to have to let this emotional part of who I am die and I just need to be a paramedic forever. Mm -hmm. And that was a weird that was a that was a tough place to come to uh emotionally for me cuz I'm just I am a compassionate, sensitive, soft person and I really love people, but I felt like the job was eating me alive, like chewing me up, spitting me out. And I was either going to have to sear that off and go full-time and just know that I was going to be a paramedic for the next 20 years or do something different. And I just began praying, Lord, you know the desires of my heart. You know that I want to, I would love to do music full-time and help people with my songs and my music and minister them that way. It's always been my dream. But if that's not going to be the case and not going to happen, would you please just either let that thing die in me? I just surrender it to you. I just submit it to you. I can't I can't be walking this tightrope anymore. Uh, 
you just have to, you have to be able to, you got to be the one that does this for yeah. me, Lord. And, yeah. um, I literally kind of around that time I was working a paramedic shift. I responded to a 911 call that came out as a lightning strike. Sure enough, this young lady got struck in the head by lightning. She was out hiking in the hills with, uh, her mother and her two little boys. Mm. Um, This freak storm came out of nowhere, zapped her in the top of the head with a bolt of lightning, kills her. The mom and the two little boys get in the Suburban, drive down a mile down the road to call 911, drove a mile back. I happened to be the paramedic that arrived on this scene. Um, Long story short, we load her up in the ambulance and start driving to the hospital, which is 15, 16 minutes away. I end up reviving her in the back of the ambulance, and she ends up making a full recovery. And about a year later, her and I connect, and we, she just starts no you know, getting to know me and learning more about who I am and my life and my dreams. And, and uh, she said she wanted to help me. She didn't know what that looked like, but she just says, I, there's just something more to you um, than this whole paramedic thing. Like, if if this wasn't what you were doing, what do you really want to do, Ryan? What do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, I'd, I told her, I, like, I'd love to do music full time. That's my heart's desire. It's my passion. And she's like, well, how do you do that? I said, well, I'm, I've been writing songs for 10 years, and um, I feel like I have five songs that I could make like a cool... EP right now, maybe shop that around to some record companies, but I need to record them in a good way. I need to professionally record them. I can't just go into my bedroom anymore and and make a, you know, a voice memo. Like, I want something legit to, to send to some people. And and I said, but I, you know, I don't have any money and it takes money to do that. So literally, um, she wrote me a check and sent me off to that recording studio and I took that little EP and sent it to a label and they they heard it and they got it and they signed me up to their label. And that was my initial kind of transition point went from just obviously from the paramedic world into mainstream Christian music. Yeah. So your your very first label that you sent something to, they, they signed you, but that that didn't necessarily, maybe contrary to what you thought, it didn't last. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you know, and naively I thought, man, I've made it. I've arrived. You know, I'm on a major label now and the coast is clear. <laughs> and and uh, 10 months into that record deal. And, it, to, you know, in all fairness, it was it was a licensing deal, a single option license deal, which is pretty minimal skin in the game for a for a label for a company um but i'm uh, nonetheless i'm grateful and i'm 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 super thankful for them um for even giving me an opportunity uh but you know 10 months into it after my first single my first single did marginally okay but then they we worked another song and it didn't do anything at ac what's called ac radio and when that happened it was like Adios. (laughs) Adios. <laughs> yeah. So you get dropped. What What does that feel like in the moment? Because you've you've obviously quit uh, being yeah. a paramedic. Yeah. I assume at the of time. Course. Yeah. I mean, my wife and I. My wife's a loan officer at the time. My wife's a loan officer. We have no children. I'm a paramedic. You know that whole classic double income, no kids, kind of risk free existence. At that moment in time, my wife had just had our firstborn. Mm. She had just quit her job. And I was getting tour opportunities, so I couldn't be a paramedic and be a touring musician. I had to choose. Mm -hmm. And that was the major crossroads for us. And so I chose to do, we chose for me to go and and follow this music opportunity. And when that thing derailed, um, it was extremely humiliating and extremely gut-wrenching. All those classic feelings, feelings of failure, regret and shame and just the heaviness, the weight of the world, like, oh, wow, it's, this is already over. You know, I just put all my hopes and dreams and stake into this, this locomotive called the music industry. And, you know, 10 months into it, after I've put all my security in this thing, it just fell off the tracks. It just derailed. And I'm 
I'm left with nothing, and my hope was crushed. My hope was gone. Yeah. So what did you do? I mean, I can imagine in that moment it was kind of like, well, do I just quit? Were you thinking of like going back to just being a paramedic? Or yeah. So I I did. <laughs> I I called uh, my bosses and my supervisors, and I said, hey, can I can I have my job back? And they're like, yeah. I mean. What you know, and then it's like, well, what happened? I thought you just got signed to a record deal, and I thought you were gonna go be some big Christian rock star. And what are you doing asking for your job back? You know, obviously you couldn't make it. Obviously you couldn't cut it. So you know, were they I mean, literally like saying that kind of stuff to you? Uh, no, they didn't say that. That's just what I heard um, in my head. But they're like, yeah, Ryan, you can, you can come and have your job back, and. But we're not going to give you like regular rotation shifts. You know, you quit. Uh, you can come back and work, but we'll give you shifts, basically PRN shifts as needed or overtime shifts that nobody really wants to work. You can have those. And so I did it and I went and, you know, humiliatingly, if that's even a word, got my job back. And so I would work as needed shifts and I would just cold call churches. Wow. And say, hey, can I come play? Can I be a part of this? I mean, I would just, I would literally was doing anything and everything just to keep us alive. You know, we have a new baby. My wife's not working anymore. I've just quit my job. Mm. And all of these things that we once had that were just pillars of security and assurance were just gone. Mm. And um, it was, I mean, we went from all of that to just scraping by living off my wife's 401k at the bank, like yeah. borrowing money from her parents. Just, it was, <laughs> it was really tough. So what, what happened next? Obviously that wasn't the end of your story. Otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. Um, during that time, as I was still working paramedic shifts and, you know, doing some more regional independent, you know, I went from I, I had no manager, no record label, no booking agency. I was just, again, all alone. And I just, the one thing that I knew that I could do without anybody's help was just to write songs. Mm. And I just kept, I just felt like that was one thing the Lord really clearly spoke to me. He just said, just keep writing songs mm. and, I, and I'll make the way. And, and I'll align you with the right people. And I didn't even know what that looked like. I mean, I still had no hope, no vision, no direction. Just, okay, I'm just going to keep writing songs of what, Lord, I feel like you're speaking to my heart and what you're doing in my life. And and uh, right at that time, I wrote a few songs, but one of those songs was uh, a song called Speak Life. Hmm. And I was actually recording that song for a little independent <laughs> record here in Franklin, Tennessee. And... Um, we were recording it in a building that Toby Mac owns. Hmm. And Toby was actually in that building kind of around the same time working on one of his records called Eye On It. And the producer that I was working with began to show Toby all of these songs that I was working on that we were working on together. And the, one of the first things he showed him was Speak Life. And Toby heard it, loved it, got it, and you know, kind of come to find out Toby had this whole other piece of just, he had kind of been thinking of that concept for a while, but just had this whole other piece of inspiration. And so they hit me up, said, we'd love to write this together. Are you into it? I'd love to record it. And when Speak Life, when Toby recorded and we wrote Speak Life together and, and he released that on his thing, it kind of, all of a sudden, I kind of surfaced again. And that was really Toby... When my world collided with Toby, that was really, truly when I felt like I kind of got picked up from the rubble a little bit. And here's this guy that I've, you know, grown up on my entire life. I mean, since I was a kid, the DC talk days, uh, he's been a huge influence in my life as a youngster. And here's this dude that just kind of, I felt like kind of picked me up out of the rubble and said, man, I believe in you. Let's go. Yeah. And so here we are. So th was there a period of time, I guess, between getting dropped from BC and, like, I think I remember you telling me, you at your producer at the time was maybe shopping your stuff around, mm -hmm. but was there, like, a period of just radio silence, like labels were not taking your stuff? Totally. Yeah, I mean, even 
after after BEC before Goatee Records, there was this you know, there was this time of people still extremely unsure about me. Uh, I was that guy that was on BEC. I was the older guy on BEC for a minute that somebody tried something with him and it didn't really work out. Mm. Um, we were, you know, my producer, co-writer, my dearest friend, you know, Jamie, was the guy who was in town here working with me. And he was showing all of my songs and everything we were working on to all these labels here in Nashville. And I felt like we kept hearing the same thing. Like, man, we... When they would hear the music that we were working on, man, we love this, and this is great, and these are radio songs for sure, no doubt, but no. Man, we love this, but no. Man, these are great, but no. And so you can only hear that so often and so many times before you kind of start to connect the dots of, well, um, <laughs> maybe the music isn't the problem, it's me. And mm -hmm. finally, you know, one guy was um, honest enough to basically tell me one day like hey ryan look the, it's not your music it's you it's your voice it's your look like it's it's just not gonna work it's not gonna stand out in this industry wow and so when i remember when i that day was a tough day for me uh and i i just felt like man the odds are just insurmountably stacked against me this is never gonna work and i can't tell you why it is Mm. <laughs> so what do you do from that? I mean, that's like that's got to just be gut wrenching. I mean, you've quit your job, you've uh, your wife's working, you've got your family, and like somebody's telling you, "Hey, you're just not going to make it." Like, mm -hmm. How do you, how did you react to that? How did you like move forward? Yeah, uh, I, honestly, dude, I don't know. What I can tell you is that. There was there was this there was a strange still small voice this certain peace in the quietness of my heart and my spirit that just always knew in the in the face of all this adversity I just kept hearing the Lord say I've still got you I'll make a way don't listen to any don't listen to those voices I'm the one I am the one and I've got my hand on you. And as hard as that was to believe in those moments of just in your face, blatant disrespect and blatant disbelief and blatant criticism, uh, I would I would sulk for a few days. I mean, that's hard to hear. That's hard to take, especially as a creative person. And, you know, um, but after a few days, I would... I would kind of get my wind back and I would just say, okay, Lord, I know I just heard all of that. I don't even know how to process that or deal with that, but I feel like you're directing my steps. Hmm. You told me to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding, but to acknowledge you and you'll direct me. So that is what I'm standing on. And that's just, that is my only explanation. Hmm. Man, that's so good. So... Fast forward, not too long after that, you've got a number one song on the top of the big AC Christian radio chart, and it's number one for, was it like 15 weeks? or Yeah, like 16, 16, 16, 16 weeks. I think it was. <clears throat> so crazy. I, I have a storm. Can you, I mean, what, how did that song come about? It was never supposed to. That's the funny thing. We had my record done, and at the last moment, my A&R guy from the label came in, popped his head in one day, and he's like, Hey, we know you already have all your radio songs done, but we you got room for one more song on your record. Why don't you just write a song that's just for you? Don't ever worry about it going to Christian radio. It'll never be a radio song. Just write whatever you want. Say what you want to say. Just do your thing. Cut loose. Be free. Hmm. I was like, okay, that should be easy enough. And so that's what we did. And literally in an afternoon, we just wrote Eye of the Storm. And we just, it was probably the easiest song I've ever been a part of because we just didn't care what anybody thought. Hmm. We just risked every, we, did, we were like, well, when the pressure is gone from nobody's going to criticize this, we don't have to slip it past any, you know, powers or gatekeepers at Christian Radio. Like, we can just say what we want to say and, and be authentic and be real. 
that that just eliminates so much pressure. Like you don't view that song, you don't see that song anymore through the lens of criticism. You're just free to write and say what you want. And we did that. And I turn. I remember. I'll never forget it. We turned that song in, and it was just like this immediate thing within the team. Like, whoa, where where did this come from? I'm like, well, that's just that's that last one that we did, you know. And and uh, kind of fast forward. Um, you know, Eye of the Storm was my fifth single, my fifth radio single in on Goatee Records. And to me, that was like, again, the journey of getting five singles deep at a record company and you start to feel that sting of like, okay, I'm barking at the door here at radio and they're just not going to let me in. They're not going to embrace me. They're not going to trust me. It's, I'm just not cut out for this. At the 11th hour, Eye of the Storm goes out to Christian Radio, and all of us were extremely unsure. And that was, to me, felt kind of like my last-ditch thing. Like, Mm. if this doesn't work, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to say. I don't know how else to go about it. So... Yeah. Here it is. Well, that's amazing. It, it's really inspiring from my vantage point of you've been the guy that has kept showing up. You've got knocked down. You've got knocked down again. You've got knocked down again and again and again. But you've just kept going at it. So many people, I feel like, would stop even, like, never mind the five singles. Mm. They probably would have stopped after the, you know, you get dropped <laughs> by the label. and Yeah. Like, what... How, how, like, how do you, when you're in those moments, if you can kind of rewind and put yourself in there, you've, you're releasing the one single doesn't work, second single doesn't work, third single doesn't work, fourth single doesn't work. Yeah. Where, where are you at at that point? Like, Very what are those conversations like that you're having with your wife of like? Tense, fragile, um, wondering, did we make a mistake? Uh, did I hear did I hear, did I actually hear from you, Lord? Uh, am I doing the right thing? Lord, do you really, are you really involved in my life at all? Are you really good? Do you really have a plan? It's just nothing but questions and deep gut-wrenching, soul-searching. But in that, again, I always have to go back to, I've always had, in the midst of all that difficult stuff, there's like this rock there's this thing in there that's like i just have this still small voice of assurance that lord you've still got me Mm. and i you're still the one orchestrating my steps and so i just keep walking forward and and being i guess i'm just being available i just Mm. keep moving forward being available being vulnerable trying to be transparent and uh but it it definitely has not been easy. Yeah. Well, man, I, I have to commend you on that because, again, it's just it's such an inspiration for, <laughs> Thanks, man. you know, all of us to watch stories like that and just to know, you know, this is for it to for it to work and for you to really pursue it that hard in the face of that much, you know, adversity. It has to be a calling. There's there's just no no way that somebody can stick it out that long and through yeah, all that. You thanks, know? man. Thank you. So i um, going to transition into the last part of our interview, Full, full Circle 5, and we'll go a little bit more lighthearted here. <laughs> sure. So, uh, good. First question, what book or record do you most commonly recommend to people? You know, there's this little book that came out several years ago. It was called The Shack, and uh, my favorite book of all time. I know it's been controversial, but to me, that book really shifted something in my heart, in my the way I look at God, the way I perceive God, the way I think about who He is as a father, His goodness, just how I relate to Him, child, father. Um, I, I've just, I've read it so many times now, and I, I, I just recommend it to everybody because I feel like even if you don't, even if you're not, you know, extremely sure about, like, the... Uh, some of the portrayals of the Trinity or the, like the deep theology behind it, just the, the relational aspect of child to father God, uh, was a pivotal thing for me. Mm. 
So good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about failure. I'm going to ask a, a little bit of a strange question, but I'll preface it by saying <laughs> failure can turn into a lesson if it alters your way of behaving or changes your perspective on something. So through that lens, do you have a favorite failure? You know, I, I would have to, I would probably have to trace it back to putting all of my stock and all of my hopes and dreams and my assurance in a, in a system and in people like a mm. record company or, or an industry kind of thing and not in the Lord and putting, having my identity so tied up in there. And then when it derails and when it all goes away, I crumble and i I feel like a complete failure and I'm, I'm completely almost taken out of life. Mm. And I don't know if that's necessarily a, a deep failure, but I, I, I can honestly say I've felt like a, a complete failure. Like I had failed on my dream. I had failed at this one shot that I had. Mm. I failed. And in that moment, I, I have to say it's, it's, pr- it's my favorite failure because it changed. It really showed me who who's steering my ship. It showed me where my assurance is. It showed me ultimately where my hope lies and that who gave me the gifts and abilities. And I always tell people, man, like all, all I do is write the songs. The rest of this I've had very little to do with. Hmm. It's good. So thinking back to your days as a paramedic before you had, you know, dove fully into this thing, to this career as an artist, what was the big, you know, if you can identify one thing that held you back from jumping all the way in, what was that? It probably finances. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's when you have a family and you have a mortgage and you have, you know, all this and that. Um, I always wanted to be really conscious and smart of, I don't want to jump out of this. I don't want to get ahead of you, Lord. I want to be a good steward of what you've given me. And I don't, I don't want to jump out of, I don't want to do anything premature. I don't want to, I want to risk and I want to follow your heart and I want to follow your leading. But I've, I always felt like the Lord directs my steps by orchestrating my circumstances. Hmm. And I've always, I've always felt like when the Lord has something for us, an opportunity for us, we don't have to go bang down the door to find it. He brings it to us. Mm. And, and so I just felt like when the Lord prepares the way and he clearly shows me when he orchestrates my circumstances to do this, then I'll know it's time to go do this. Mm. And when that whole making, you know, the lightning strike, making the EP to turned into songs at Christian radio and touring opportunities. I was like, okay, there we go. There's, there's my leading. And, um, he's, he's, he's yeah. giving us provision. He's providing a way to do that. Yeah. So good. What is something that's working for you right now? I would say, being able to tell my story. Mm. Um, this last two years have, you know, have given me, there's a lot of people who still don't know who I am and a lot of people who don't know much about me or my story. And I feel like the more that I am able to share about my journey, the more people are v- really compelled by it. Um, and it's good for me to keep telling it because it just keeps reminding me mm of the Lord's goodness and his faithfulness and where I've been and where, where we're headed. And I don't even know where we're headed, but, um, I, I feel like it's just given me opportunity to continually stay active and be out with people and just to inspire people, love on people where they are and just to be available and to be vulnerable and to be tangible. We're all just people. And I think that's what we need that's definitely working. Yeah, it's good. So this last question is so interesting because we, we had the, the pleasure of, of writing this morning, you, you and myself and our friend Matt Hammett, and wrote this song exactly about what I'm about to ask you. So maybe there's some, some, <laughs> some, some raw rawness to it. But if you were to wake up tomorrow morning and all of this stuff that you've worked for this entire career, this, your business, your, the whole thing just falls apart. 
and you've got to start from square one, but you still have all the experience, you still mm-hmm. have all the relationships, where would you start? Do I have to start in this business again? <laughs> If it all it's fell apart, choice. man, I I can tell you I'd probably go start a food truck. I would probably I would probably continue to write songs with people, but I would probably just get removed from the grind mm. and I would probably go buy a little food truck and make gourmet like tacos. Mm. Lettuce wrapped tacos. <laughs> I'm hungry now, Keto style. I love it. So, uh, you've just come out with a new record. Yeah. Talk about that, man. It's Dude, um, it's my second record on Goatee Records. Uh, it's called No Matter What, and it's nine songs. It just, I always, man, to me, these songs are like, and you get it, uh, they're just like my babies. They're like my kids. Like, I just, I love every song differently. We worked on this record for two years. We prayed, just prayed through everything. Um, I feel like every song exists for a very specific reason. Every song is saying something very different, but yet there's this very common underlying thread throughout the whole record of just beloved identity. Mm. You are you are beloved. You're a daughter, you're a son, no matter what you think. And I, I write those songs and I... I wrote this record because I need to hear it. I wrote it for me because these are the things that I need to hear. And if I need to hear them, I'm sure we all do. Mm, it's good. So the gospel, that that was a, your first single off this record, yeah. right? Yeah. And it, it, it did really well. I, I We were just talking about it before then. But if you're, you know, landing in the top three on, on a radio chart, that's 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 a big win. So congrats Thanks, on that. Thanks, and Thank you. Um, new single out. As we speak now, right? Yeah, it's called No Matter What, title track of the record. Um, and again, it just comes from Romans 8, saying when Paul talks about how uh, I'm convinced that there's nothing in all creation, no, not a single created thing will ever be able to separate you mm-hmm. from the love of God. And I, that's something that I've struggled with for a long time, especially being born and raised in the church, kind of a a legalistic religious environment where I was taught at an early age that subtly taught that at an early age that I might be able to lose my salvation, that that God is moody, that he's mostly disappointed in me, which sent me the better part of my spiritual life into cycles of dysfunction and performance-based relationship with him. And it hasn't been until the last few years where I felt like the Lord has just been peeling away all those blinders and layers of lies, really, mm-hmm. and showing me that through just obvious scripture, you're not you're not separated from me. You're my son, mm. who I'm well pleased. Like all these promises that we just don't don't let sink in. Sometimes that's what I wanted this whole record to do: was just let it sink in. We are beloved mm. children of the King, no matter what we think about it. Mm. So good. So how can people find you, interact with you, social media, website, all that stuff? Super easy. Um, RyanStevensonMusic.com is my main website. And from there, Twitter and Instagram, Ryan's Music, R-Y-A-N-S Music, or Facebook, Ryan Stevenson Music. Yeah. Easy. Love it, man. Well, thanks for being here with us and sharing your story. Thanks, buddy.